Welcome to the Practical Enneagram. John Lukovic is a New York-based artist, Enneagram teacher, fourth-way student and practitioner, and now author. He's the co-host of the Big Hormone Enneagram podcast, which I really enjoy. John's just written a really profound book on the instinctual drives in the Enneagram. There's a link to it in the episode notes. Honestly, if you want to understand this aspect of the Enneagram better, you've got to read this book. The book is also sort of a fiery call for inner practice. The phrase inner work is now becoming very bandied around in the Enneagram field. It's bordering on becoming annoying, at least for me. But John really grounds what this means. I experienced this episode as I was listening back as a sort of meditation on each of the instinctual approaches, these ways that John has developed in order to help us to vivify our instinctual lives. You can also just listen for the way John and I are communicating. So in Enneagram terms, John is a sexual type. And for me, at least, there's always this unsubtle provocativeness to sexual types which personally makes me sit up and pay attention I notice that with other teachers in the field with this drive dominant I can learn a lot from them because I can keep my attention on them my self-preservation dominance is probably a lot less um, noticeable but for me at least it's woven into the production of this podcast it's fun to listen for clues for people's instinctual preferences as I move through life these days now if you'll excuse me me, I'm off to do a pelvic dance to Pony by Genuine. I hope that you get as much from hearing from John as I did. by the way I think any book is like a war it's like a war on everything your attention span your resistance absolutely yeah so we're going to focus on the instinctual approaches and integrating the blind spot but before we do I wanted to tell you what I found the most useful on my first reading of the book so the whole contextualization of instinct work I just think you did that really well thank you And then the book dropped me into a deeper understanding of what each instinct is. So, for example, thinking about the sexual instinct as the drive to put put oneself ahead of sexual competition. It opened something up for me that studying Russ Hudson's zones didn't quite get for me. Um, description of the self-preservation types. So I am a self-preservation type. This is personally very comforting for me somehow, like the naming of the struggle the struggle to find a creative direction to apply drive. I have always felt very misunderstood around that, around Mm. what ambition is for me. And then the descriptions of the blind spot types, again, really opened things up for me as well. Or I realized that I am very likely social blind rather than sexual blind. And I had thought I was sexual blind. So Mm. thank you for writing it. I will be Mm -hmm. recommending it far and wide. And I think only you probably could have written this book, having made this sort of your life's work until now. Yeah, yeah, I was... uh... Uh, well, I'm a very obsessive person, and I think I wrote at the be- intro, um, I had some kind of like altered state of consciousness experiences where I became viscerally in touch with very, very deep fear in my body, but it was around if I was attractive. And I thought, this is the dumbest thing I could ever give a shit about. <laughs> and I was like, I have to understand, you know, I identify as a four, and I was like, this is incredibly superficial. Why is my attention energy around this? And so I had to do all this research in biology and try and understand myself as an organism and as an animal because Mm -hmm. my mind could not come to terms with how dumb I thought my deepest fears were. (laughs) So I really appreciate it. And I really actually um, means a lot to me that that the what you spoke of with the self prez, um, you know, because I think that's one of the things that um, annoys me a lot about the Enneagram world is that there's a kind of favoritism that it runs throughout how people describe types and how they describe instincts. And I'm identified as a sexual four and, and most people misidentify as that type. You know, if you listen to the podcast, we've got a lot of stuff about type nine versus type four and like kind mm-hmm. of giving back all the stuff people have attributed to four back to nine or trying to recognize that like intimacy is really more of the social instinct. It's not the sexual instinct. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people are very prideful about their intimacy. And it's like, let's look at it more honestly and more, um, I don't know, under the hood and less flattering. Mm-hmm. And, and then with self pres people, they always get stereotyped as being like, they like to be cozy. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, like, like they just want to sit with their warm tea and mittens and just whatever. 
And it's like, um, you know, <laughs> that's not true at all. Yeah, it's so much more nuanced. The, the descriptions of all of them are so much more nuanced. Um, it's, it's exciting. It's exciting that this is out there now. And um, I hope that everyone reads it. So of all the things, instinctual approaches, of all the things we could have spoken about, I mean, there's just so many things in the book. Two reasons for this focus. Really, firstly, I want to know how I can use this myself. And I want to know if this lends itself to practices that I can offer coaching clients. So yeah, John, would love for you to say what what are the instinctual approaches and how you develop them? Cool. Yeah. So, and I also mentioned this in the book, I put all my tricks in the book and I have nothing left. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm social blind. That's my blind spot. It's my weakest instinct. First of all, when we're talking about a blind spot, it is actually blind. Mm-hmm. Like in the sense that we really have no idea what that instinct represents. We generally have very superficial ideas about what we think social is, if that's our blind spot, or what self prez is, if that's our blind spot or sexual if that's our blind spot but it is a whole other planet and like you know i'm in my 30s and i'm like even after i wrote this book i'm going through some personal crises where i'm realizing how not seeing myself as a person like i've objectified myself my whole life in ways i did not understand and i'm still trying to find language around Mm. and so neglecting that instinct uh has cost me a great deal in my life just in ways that i was sort of taking advantage of and whatever i was taking advantage of because i sold myself not as a person but as like a thing Mm. and so blind spot is huge and i intuited that it was big uh but i would always be told stuff like go to a meeting go Mm. to go hang out with friends uh go join a club and you know those things would just absolutely not i would not do any of that stuff like not interested at all. So I wanted to find ways that I could actually access the social instinct that I knew I already had. Everybody already has that blind spot instinct in them. It's just not given enough airtime and not given enough presence. It's a strategy that we have not relied on very much. So we don't have very much practice with it. We all feel fairly um, childish and silly and easily humiliated around it. I am in the Gurdj of work. In the Gurdj of work, we spend a lot of time on sensation. Uh, that's the key of all inner work, in my opinion, is physical sensation. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm studying, researching instinct. I'm trying to un- locate it in my own body, doing sensation practice every day. And I had this experience of meeting this girl. I live in Brooklyn and, you know, the subway is always broken. And I was going to the subway and this girl starts talking to me, trying to like figure out where the shuttle buses and I'm like walking very focused and like on target and she keeps talking to me and I'm like she's cute and stuff but I'm not like attracted to her and I'm like why is she talking to me you know <laughs> like Ugh. and we're talking we get we get and, and she's interesting but I'm like I'm, I'm doing something you know this is my social blindness and and I get on the bus and we're really like close together because of how crowded it is and I'm doing my sensation stuff all the time my sensation practice and I'm realizing how talking to this girl we're close enough that I'm realizing how much she's affecting my body mm. and I'm feeling waves of sort of like she'll ask me a question and if I go to my head which was like my default I'd have some bullshit but if I was like staying in contact with my body and what was like arousing not sexually arousing but just like arousing my energy mm. I I would have all kinds of shit to say and it would like flow and I was enjoying it and I could feel it in my spine. I was like, oh my God, like this is why people talk to other people. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I remember I met up with a friend after and she was like, wow, your your energy is just like your boundaries seem open. You seem mm. like you're more relaxed. And, you know, the feedback about my whole life is how like closed off and inaccessible I am. So I was like, I took that really seriously and I started kind of trying to map what was going on with the social instinct, what I was doing by default. And, you know, in teaching instinct and you mentioned the zones and I was also like, what what are these? Like, you know, I couldn't quite apply them and they were like, are they areas of life? Are they needs? Are they qualities? And do they apply to people across cultures and times or is it just specific to like professional managerial class types? So yeah, it's just started trying to like piece out and observe we're all very easy it's very easy to see what's messed up around about people around you so trying to see like what do I think is messed up about this person what do I think is messed up about this person and then trying to apply that to myself when you get in touch with the body you see how much people are communicating through the body and how much just they don't even have to move very much but their facial gestures their ways their shoulders are held the ways their pelvis is tilted all these things are communicating boundaries Mm. and they're communicating like for lack of a better term instinctual energy. We're constantly giving each other signals of like, approach me, don't approach me. I'm closed off. I'm not closed off. I'm interested in you. I'm really disinterested in you. And I also noticed, if I'm, am I going on too long? 
No, carry on. Okay. I have a friend who's uh, sexual blind, and he's a very handsome fella. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he was having a hard time on like Tinder or something. And you know, I'm a I'm a long term monogamous type. But mm-hmm. he was like, John, what am I doing wrong from an instinctual point of view? And he sent me screenshots mm-hmm. of his Tinder comments, and I was like, man, you're you're just so friendly. You know, what I started realizing is the way that he is a sexual blind was diffusing tension, and that's because he had a social dominant instinct that wanted to create a social connection, which is like great, but if you're not introducing any tension, there's no chemistry, there's no sexual charge. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, that's really interesting. And I started noticing my sexual blind friends, like they drop the charge because the charge functions to polarize, right? Mm -hmm. Like to create sexual tension, it's like you have the the possibility of coming together or repelling. And you have to really accept the repelling. And Mm -hmm. if your social drive is stronger, it's going to be harder to accept that that necessary repellent quality that the sexual drive comes with because you're not trying to connect with everybody. You're trying to get a specific kind of energy going. And so I was like, all right, how do I talk to my friend about how he's talking to girls on Tinder? How do I talk to somebody else who's social blind who feels like as uh, totally dumb as I do? How do I talk to a a self-pressed blind person and not make them feel childish? You have to draw on what we've already got. You have to draw on the instincts that we already have. And the approaches are my best attempt. You know, they're using language and kind of speaking to the mental center about the body center to try to get some texture and try to get people to have an expanded vocabulary around what could be going on in the body underneath their habitual awareness and trying to name some of these things that we're always picking up on or always reacting to but we don't have a lot of vocab around yeah distinctions around the this was how the instinctual approaches were developed that all makes sense do we need to have anything already sort of embodied within us in order to use these instinctual approaches not necessarily i think it just begins with actually practicing sensing Mm. so like people listening like actually sensing your feet contacting the floor and noticing how poor and terrible our quality of sustained sensation is you know we get easily discouraged when we start to see how asleep we are. Part of the the prerequisites for inner work of any kind, and especially Enneagram work, and I don't feel like this is emphasized enough, is that we are asleep, that we don't know ourselves. We need the Enneagram because we don't know ourselves. And we didn't choose a personality. We didn't choose our type. We didn't choose to be asleep. But we can choose to effort to be a little bit more awake. And the effort to be a little bit more awake is an effort of seeing, you know, seeing the, the landscape and geography of our sleep more vividly. Mm. So part of using the approaches is to see like, I don't know what any of this shit means, you know, like, mm-hmm. like I don't know what this is. I don't like, I have names, like, I don't know for people listening, like uh, for self prez I have these like qualities of attention energy that I call approaches because they're how we approach our instinctual needs. So for mm. the self-preservation drive, the drive to uh, maintain our physical well-being. Uh, I have names like grounding, sensing, and pragmatism. And in the in the book, I talk about how there's being present to the energy of the instinct in the body. There's being present to the self-preservation instinct. Provides a natural sense of being grounded, of being connected to yourself being rooted in something, but that depending on type and history and all kinds of stuff, we can get out of touch with the real instinct, the the living presence of the instinct and kind of get wrapped up in emotional mental stuff and overdo it or underdo it. So in the case of like overdoing grounding, this is especially true for people who are dominant in this instinct, self-preservation. Like when, when somebody who's overdoing grounding, like travels, they'll bring like their whole fucking closet. You know, it's like they can't, or they'll eat too much. There's like this over need to kind of grasp for things because it's like I'm not actually feeling connected and at home in myself. I'm trying to make everything else the home because I'm actually feeling so ungrounded versus doing underdoing it, which I represent like plus and minus. Uh, mm. The minus side is underdoing it, which is usually typical of people who are more self pres blind, but um, self pres doms and middles can can have this too. They can just be ungrounded, frenetic. Their attention's going everywhere. They can't hold their focus on anything and they're, they're kind of bouncing all over or f- spacing out or whatever. And they're not connected to their own bodies. And so all it requires to start looking at these is to actually sense yourself, to actually check in with your own body, to actually start to, um, to understand the difference between being present and not being present. And that difference is very, very easy to 
convince ourselves that we understand. No matter how far along we are in some spiritual path or inner work or psychological work, never take for granted that you're awake or that you're not not in your trance. Like that's the thing that people start to lose as they, they do a bunch of workshops and inner work groups is like, oh yeah, I know how to be present. And it's like, if, if you're taking that for granted at any time, don't know what it means to be present. And so this is just like, you can begin using these approaches as, as just sort of like, I'm, I'm inhabiting my body and I'm I'm sensing this, I'm sensing this, I'm sensing this in response to that. Just kind of started to take an inventory of what I am, what I'm sensing, what I'm not sensing. Everybody has these three instincts in them and they do, they do all these, um, these approaches all the time, but there's ones that like barely get any airtime, any practice. Mm -hmm. For me, um, and I have this whole thing in the, in the book about how the blind spot instinct seems like a threat to our dominant instinct. And so I'm a sexual type with a self-preservation middle instinct and a social blind spot. And so Mm -hmm. the approaches of pursuing magnetism and intensification, my personality is identified with doing those all the time. And I have to be doing them or I don't feel like me. Mm -hmm. It's like not even just, I'm not gonna get my needs met. It's like on a deeper level, I don't even feel like John unless I'm doing them to some extent. And to do them because of my instinctual order, my instinctual stacking, being available, Mm -hmm. uh, signaling and navigating what these things represent, I ha- I feel like they're going to water me down and bo- make me boring and uninteresting mm-hmm. and not juicy and threaten my dominant instinct. And so like what happens if I actually just like relax my boundaries a little bit? Like if you're at a restaurant and there's like people around and there's maybe like your date or your friends or whatever and then the like the the server or whatever, you know, you just open up to like kind of include their energy in your awareness. And for me, that's very difficult and not natural whereas some types it's just like they're 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 hearing the conversations around them you know what i'm saying yeah 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 if we can do a whistle stop for of them all so the three approaches of the self-preservation drive grounding rooting to one center and place of balance through the body Mm -hmm. is that anything like sensing the dantian Dantian. Yeah, yeah yeah Yeah, I mean that's that's one piece of it. I mean, really, it's just like, am I collected? Mm. Am I here at all? And so, for anybody listening, just like take a breath into your lower belly and just like bring your attention. You know, like, and and this might sound a little wooey or airy fairy for people that don't do a lot of sensation work, but like, you know, if you're looking at a computer or you're listening in earphones or whatever, just like notice how much your attention is kind of like moving toward an object or a sound or an experience and just kind of just bring it back to yourself. It's as if we have like an atmosphere or we have an energy or an aura or something, you know, whatever you want to think of it and just, just come back to yourself. Just, just be in yourself. Notice yourself as a physical body. Notice yourself as a torso with legs and arms and a head and just mm-hmm. come back to yourself rather than kind of the way that our energy disperses and leaks and goes into things. So it's just being collected, being in your own center, being in your own body. It can just be as simple as like sensing the contact, the physical contact. If you're sitting, your your butt against the chair or whatever. That's so simple. And yet it's something that most of us, even if we're self dominant don't really do very well. Well, Thank you. The second approach of the Mm self-preservation drive, sensing, sensitivity to one's own state through the signals of the body. Attention is on physical feedback and impressions. I mean, it's, they're all very similar, um, but they're kind of trying to point at different aspects of the same quality. And so for sensing, it's like when I work with people who are self-preservation blind, I do a lot of just like mirroring how when they have an emotion or a thought, I try to bring it back to their body. Like, what are you feeling in your body right now? What is this related to? And there's a way in which we're kind of um, tracking the way my present state is actually related to a, a body sensation. My emotional state is related to a body sensation. My thoughts are related to a body sensation or a posture. And so this is taking that grounding principle and just sort of deepening it with like, rub your hands together like you're you know like just just rub them together and then like rub them harder and then stop and like just sense actually it's not just even some sort of vague sense of being here or present it's like are you literally actually sensing the impressions on your skin are you literally sensing the impressions within your gut and your belly your stomach and are you li- literally sensing the impressions of, of how it feels to breathe tracking and and, and creating like a connection between what seems to be going on like quote out here and what's going on inside the body. This is something that self-preservation people do selectively. 
I'm very present to my hunger or I'm present to my stress or I'm present, but maybe I'm not so present to the physical sensations of anxiety. Like I might just be caught up in my thinking about it. Is it, does it making sense? It does. It makes complete sense. I mean, this is really dumb and this is also me being a four, but like one time uh, I went into like this like secondhand store, this like, uh, you know, I don't know, one of these stores where like people give away their junk and, you know, and I think those kind of stores are great and I use them, but like I went in one and I started feeling nauseous and I went outside and I felt better. I was like, and I went inside and I felt nauseous again. And I started realizing that the aesthetics of the place were so terrible. I was feeling sick in my stomach, <laughs> sick in my body. So it's like very fussy for bullshit. A lot of people who are self pressed blind won't track how much maybe like clutter in their environment is affecting their state mm. or their lack of water is affecting their state or, you know, just even lighting, like these kinds of environmental things, like they people won't be tracking how much is affecting the way they think, the way they feel, the way they operate. Mm. So bringing a little bit more coherence between inner and outer by being in touch with what's going on in my organism is, is incredibly important. I feel like I overpay attention to that. The third one, John, pragmatism a through line of attention mm -hmm. orienting to processes and progression. This approach is an enduring, persistent quality of sensation and attention. You know, I was Russ Hudson's assistant for five years and Russ is self pressed blind. And mm -hmm. then my dad is a five also like Russ is. He's self pressed dominant mm -hmm. and contrast of how their fiveness was operating. Somebody who is self preservation dominant, like let's say they have to like, like their sink is kitchen sink is leaking. Somebody who's self preservation dominant, generally speaking, will have the ability to just like sit with the problem and look mm -hmm. at it and try to like say, okay, here's a pipe. And it's, uh, you know, there's these different like, you know, things to, to, to tighten or loosen. The water's coming out here. Looks, I, it looks like I need to tighten this. Okay, how do I tighten this? Okay, I need this kind of tool. And I'll go and do that. And it's like a step-by-step -step sticking with it. It's, and I'm sustaining a motivation. Mm -hmm. People who are blind and self preservation dip, typically have a difficulty sustaining motivations that have to do with their own well-being or something practical, mm -hmm. something that is not related to other people mm -hmm. or related to doing something that will eventually create a payoff with other people. And so pragmatism is really just like, it's the self-preservation quality of when I'm grounded in myself, I'm sensing myself, uh, I can stick with something. Uh, boredom might come up. You know, self press types get stereotyped as like, they love to do the bills and they like mm -hmm. hate the bills just as much as anybody else does. Yeah. But they know it's important and they'll stick with it to figure it out. Uh, everybody but myself and one sister are self press dominant in a family. And my mm -hmm. brother... He fixes bikes and shit and he like knows how to do all this mechanical stuff and he just like figures it out. My mom knows how to like she raises chickens, you know, like, you know, she's like figures out how to like sort of take care of it. She's a self pres to take care of animals and all and people. She was a nurse. And so there's a lot to admire in this quality that I think, again, because of people's biases or whatever within teaching and resources and books and whatever will really trivialize and dismiss the self preservation drive. Mm. as being boring or like oh that's all that that dumb shit but it's like nothing gets accomplished nothing happens unless that self pres thing is there you know sexual and social both need other people in different ways to kind of bounce off or react to and and so this pragmatism also goes into do i do spiritual practice do mm -hmm. i meditate am i able to be alone with myself mm -hmm. that's really important i didn't really even mention that in the book but like i i wrote before i wrote the book i had like 20 pages on the on the approaches and i was like no one's gonna read this shit and so really? i didn't really edit it down oh yeah, my yeah. god I, this book was ridiculously long and then i realized that people was not going to read all that stuff and so it's mm -hmm. it's much more abbreviated but yeah it's like that can my attention stay with something and that's what mm -hmm. pragmatism is about for me mm -hmm. okay that's so clear as well um how would you chunk that down into a teeny practice for someone who is low in that? Again, this is, this is my book. Again, I keep saying <laughs> that dumb phrase, but but I didn't I didn't spell it out like this. But like I mentioned, like sensing your right hand, like you know I mentioned earlier, sensing your feet, and like how many people are still doing that? That's not a that's not like a gotcha. That's just like we're not <laughs> all, we're all not doing that. And so it's like being able to stick with those things, stick with your breathing, mm. stick with small manageable things that have no consequence other than you're just not doing it. Like that's a place to start because uh, especially like an adult who has really low or undeveloped pragmatism, they're gonna come up against all kinds of shame and self-judgment and even more deeply like 
these are all related to very early life experiences. And there's a part of somebody who is self-preservation blind that's like still trying to get mom to help me in that way. So there's this individuation thing that has to happen. And part of it is like burning through, so to speak, or processing or being with all the voices, the grief, the pain, the whatever that as adults, we think I shouldn't feel this way. But there's a lot there that has been in place that keeps us fixed in the places that we're in. And it just seems like, oh, I can't fix the kitchen sink, like whatever, that's not a big deal. But what is there that feels wrong to keep my attention focused? Oh, that's great. Yeah. Let's go to sexual. So the approach is the sexual drive. The first one, pursuing, locking on to what attracts with focused energy and attention, letting what's extraneous fall away. So tunnel vision on the object of desire. I feel like most people would understand that one. Do you? I think so. Um, Like this is sort of an obvious feature of the sexual drive, I would say. Mm -hmm. I taught uh, something called New York Enneagram, like Mm -hmm. with my friend Julie Harris. And we would do these slides and she would have a a slide of a mountain, slide of a cave, and then slide of, um, I think it's Gustave Dwar or whatever. No, maybe it's not him. Anyway, these etchings of... uh, Paradise Lost, where Virgil and um, Dante are in front of this like array of angels. It was the, it was to illustrate the qualities of the instincts, and so the self preservation was the mountain. Sexual was like the cave tunnel vision, and then the the before the 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 variety was the social. And um, people often call mistakenly call the sexual drive one on one. Social is one-on-one and social is groups. It's the adaptable instinct. But sexual mm-hmm. is one-on-one, but it's not like one-on-one relating. Yeah. It's like, I'm into you. You mm-hmm. know, it's sexual and it's the tunnel vision. Like one way I think of it is like if you uh, if you go to a, you go to like a party, like a house party, and everybody's like kind of getting lit or whatever. And mm-hmm. there's like a couple or like two people who have like met and they're like in it. And you, you, you go, you know, it's like you walk in and you're like, hey, what's up? Oh, I got, oh, okay. You know, you back off. You know, they're in the zone. They're focused on each other and this so there's this pursuing is this quality of like locking on it's not just like i'm giving my attention to something it's like boom and it's excluding things our blind spot is sexual like we might have some access to this but this sense of excluding or cutting other people out feels a little bit rude or it feels like yeah. i shouldn't do that or it feels like i'm inconsiderate or it feels like i'm being creepy if i'm too too much employing this but somebody who is probably a stronger sexual you know there's just this like boom kind of you're the you're the juicy thing my attention is on you and it's expelling other people every everybody else feels like a bush in the way of the the (laughs) the object when this gets this gets negative it can have kind of a vampiric predatory quality so it is really important to like with the sexual drive really having that in tandem with the social instinct and the cell present instinct so being grounded and being available and like reading the person as a human being but also being like what's up you know (laughs) We've all been around people that are like getting into each other that just met or something, you know, and we're like, oh, my God, there is something happening between those two. You know, that's the quality that is getting employed. There. The second one, magnetism, displaying oneself while vacillating between pushing and pulling back attention and energy to create interest tension and preoccupation provocative display to draw attention with the aim to attract some and repel others. It's a quality of displaying oneself and also retracting. It's kind of this like game in a way of like somebody to like look at for this very clearly like videos of is just Prince, Mm -hmm. right? The artist Prince and I fucking love Prince, but he's just like doing this all the time where he's like, you know, you could think of it as like peacocking. Um, That's a little simplistic because a lot of people, you know, whatever, but you know, there's a way that it's like this dr- dramatic presentation and maybe like pressing on you and it's similar to pursuing, but it's like, I'm pressing my energy against you. It's there's something assertive or aggressive about it in a certain way. Like it's not like, Hey, this is me. Nice to meet you. It's mm-hmm. like putting my thing out there real like a mating dance kind of thing. And then pulling away and like inviting a vacuum, so to speak, and an energetic or attentional vacuum that somebody else wants to kind of like come in or meet you at. So like, um, if you're flirting with somebody and you give them really intense eye contact and then you just like fucking ignore them for a second and then you go back to him and it's like, you know, this can get into like, you know, maybe negative manipulation yeah. things, but in a, in a real flirt flirtation, that's genuine. There's this kind of play of like, what are they doing? You know, it's like this and it's like exciting and it invites if it's just too much like, hey, it's really I really like you. It's kind of boring. But if there's this like tension build up, that's what it's about. It's like pressing your your 
your energy, your boundaries against somebody and then pulling away and then they like either want to join you or they're like, all right, this person's a weirdo. Like, let me get out of here. I'm not, I'm not feeling this. This is something that it can easily mistaken with the social drive wanting to like display who I am. That's a kind of a different thing of like, I want to tell you the kind of person I am. This is not about personhood. This is about um, maybe showing off my goodies, whatever that those mm. are, you know, this kind of thing. Yeah, perfect. So someone who was didn't access these approaches in them, would you have them practice by going to a party and and doing the whole, I don't know, whatever you called it? You know, there is a lot of wounding around the sexual yeah. drive. And it and it depends on sex and gender. It depends on all these other things. It depends on how confidence. It depends on what the trauma might be. Um, I think one of the first things, the prerequisite, is to never be too sure what our dominant instinct is and yeah. to and to just experiment with it and see what's comfortable and uncomfortable. Well, what I always have people do, actually, um, and it's very dumb and embarrassing, but um, mm-hmm. I'll have people really breathe into their pelvis, breathe into their genitals, and kind of like rock their, um, close their eyes, and they like rock their pelvis around, like just sort of exaggerating and moving. Mm-hmm. I find men especially are like fucking not in their pelvis at all. Really crazy. It's I love to dance. And what I notice like teaching male friends to dance is like they'll, they can bounce, they can shoulder, they can bob. Mm-hmm. But just really getting in the in the pelvis is very uh, difficult. And like I know my ladies out there uh, complain about how bad a lot of guys are in bed. And it's they're not in their bodies. And it's sort of like the pounding like kind of quasi porn thing. Mm-hmm. Like you need to kind of have like a feminine energy in your pelvis in a certain way, contained mm-hmm. by your masculine energy. You know, there that like there's a kind of like a, a lack of trust of my own physical body when I'm rigid in the pelvis, especially as a man. Mm-hmm. And I think women, generally speaking, have not been invited to experience their own potency in the pelvis, their own explore their own pleasure, their genitals, their males and females. You know, I don't know the female experience, but at least what I understand from friendships and stuff like this is, you know, our genitals are sense organs in the sense that we are getting data about how we feel about other people through our genitals reactions all the time. Yeah. Whether we're attracted to somebody, there might be even more information out there coming from the genitals, but like our genitals are responding to people. And one of the things that happens often is that we often form intimate love, romantic relationships with people that we have a good social connection with. We have a not, we're not actually attracted to uh, or vice versa, we're attracted to them, but there's a really poor social th- connection. There's lack of respect. There's a lack of seeing the other person. And so how do I bring awareness there? It's like, a, you know, you need to do a lot of breathing, a lot of moving, practicing moving. And then I, I have people imagine that their pelvis is like, um, I think my friend Sherry Fox helped me develop this. So I want to credit her, but uh, like a like a bowl, like your pelvis is a bowl with a ball in it, a bowl ball, bowl ball but with a ball in it. And it's like you're trying to move the ball into in around the bowl and exploring like the texture, quality, feeling of being in your pelvis mm. and really exaggerating. And, and it's actually just going to look f- silly and feel stupid and feel whatever. And then I have people like, I turn on music and have people like dance. One of my favorite songs is Pony by Genuine. And it's just like a great fucking staying in your pelvis Part of getting in touch with the sexual drive for all of us is finding what turns us on about ourselves. It can look like narcissism, people, especially who are low in sexual, and there's something narcissistic about it, but it's good. It's an invitation to be invested in yourself. Be like, what what is interesting about me to me? Mm -hmm. What's going to make me like really go hard on, man, I like the way I look in this outfit. Like this talent of mine is like, I'm just into this. And a lot of times people who are sexual blind put a lot of energy into they're, they're very, like my girlfriend's sexual blind. Mm. They can be very interesting, very sexy, but their outward presentation can be kind of neutralizing all their unique, weird, freaky mm-hmm. shit and feeling like, oh, that's the way to create connection. That's the way to be palatable. That's the way to interest, have someone interested in me. Mm. But I know a lot of sexual blind types who've gone through a lot of relationships that, were, that are, it's like, in retrospect, they weren't putting forward their flavor. They weren't putting forward their feathers. And it's like the sexual drive is like, this is my flavor, very specifically over and over and over and over. And do you like it? Do you like it? Do you like it? Do you like it? And that repels a lot of people. But some people are getting really addicted to that. It's like a pheromonal signature. So anyway, it's like, like it's not conceptual, like what's my stamp? What's my flavor? It's in the body of like, boom, boom. And we all need to practice this, even if we're sexual dominant. I'm definitely going to practice inhabiting my pelvis. Especially white people really need a lot of work (laughs) on the pelvis. Okay, good. So intensification, the third of the sexual approaches, amplifying and galvanizing energy and excitation with the aim of dissolving or penetrating boundaries, bringing a quality of 
activating urgency that encourages the surrendering of boundaries in the self and others. Yeah, so I mean, in, these all kind of build on each other, as you're probably noticing. So with intensification, it's hard to describe it without making it sound like a bunch of other things. Mm. But it really is like a letting yourself be like activated and excited by something to be like, really like, oh, fuck, yeah, you know, like mm. getting this sense of like building the energy and like not necessarily needing it mirrored in the other person. You're just actually turned on. And I don't just mean like you're aroused. I just mean like you're like, hell yes. You know, like humans just like make sure we're checking in with other people a lot of like, is this acceptable amount of excitement? And, you know, we're pretty good at like allowing people their social excitement of just like, I'm having fun. This is great. But that's a very different quality than the sexual kind of like, yes. And I, I'm trying to nail specifically the difference, but there is a kind of like escalating the stakes with sexual. There's mm -hmm. escalating the tension a little bit. And that's what I mean is like, if you're in a, in a new relationship and you're you're making love or like getting it ready to have sex or whatever, and they're just like, oh, this is great. You know, it's like, that's not going to do anything. But if you're like, really just like, oh, I want to just like bite this person and like, mm -hmm. yes, you know, and it's like just this, ooh, like, like that kind of like, um, you are a fruit that I just want all the juices from, you know, like that <laughs> kind of quality letting yourself kind of be taken you know it's like especially men i think have a hard time uh letting themselves be taken they kind of like need to inhabit like i'm always going to be like the in charge one but it's like i become very self-restricted and kind mm -hmm. of non-spontaneous this can still be a very masculine energy but it's like you're like oh my god just like yes you know this kind of quality and it doesn't always have to be related to sex directly i always get made fun of because of my love of egypt and like you know, uh, when I when I like in Egypt and I see the Sphinx, I'm just like, oh, my God, <laughs> you know, like, yes. Part of it is because there are things that, that have two functions that they like enhance either like the kind of rep, like unconsciously they work to enhance the sexual display. Like this thing is going to make me interesting or contribute to my art or to my sense of self. And also that this thing is going to actually like revise me, like change who I am. And the sexual drive is like change me. You know, it's like there's a lot of like jumping into the next, the, jumping into something that's going to not just be exciting or cool or fun, but like something that's going to like transfigure my sense of self i'm just letting the energy of this thing like basically like possess me and, and transform mm -hmm. me and like let it let, let's see where it goes rather than just being like this is rad it's very mm -hmm. cool i like this thing it's like oh my god this thing is gonna like revise me i think the sexual drive is really um seeks those things out and intensification yeah. is about like dropping boundaries and help if we're in a romantic situation and like i'm like into it then you feel like yeah i can be into it too it gives me permission to be into it too i can mm -hmm. drop some my boundaries too got it they're much more fun sounding than the the self-preservation approaches <laughs> i spent my year being in shame over have being sexual blind because that's that's what i thought I, I was going through this training with i don't know if you know russ hudson and cheryl richardson the coach mm -hmm. they're leading this mm -hmm. year-long training so i've been doing that yeah and honestly i think i think this is second for me but i still recognize ways in which i temper mm -hmm. myself I mean, I don't, I don't let myself do that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I think we have shame around all three instincts, but mm. especially around like, like, and this one, you know, this is pretty loaded and um, it's really normal to feel boring. You can feel yeah. like, like frigid. You can feel like everybody else is having a better time than me. You can mm. feel like I'm not interesting. You can feel like no one would really want this kind of flavor I've got. You got to kind of like smooth my edges out. Cause like, uh, like this is, this about me is like really shitty or under desirable or this or this like i said uh my my girlfriend uh is sexual blind and she is you know the juiciest thing i've ever experienced in my life and <laughs> it's thing. it's really fun like you know she's puerto rican and so she mm. has um she has curly really super curly hair mm. like big just enormous hair and <laughs> she used to straighten it because she was sort of feel like you know she had to kind of you know she grew up around white people and she had to like yeah. like straighten it and stuff like this and and the first time we were together uh i saw like her her curls came out a little bit and i was like what is what is hello you know what is that <laughs> and she didn't believe me that i was like into it now she wears her hair curly all the time but it was like she kind of felt like she had tamped down her like unique mm -hmm. flavor she's also a nine and so all that came together and it's like no that shit like maybe most people will not like that it's mm -hmm. like fucking good forget them mm -hmm. you know but the, like i like like i'm i'm so into it you know and um learning to trust and have faith 
that there's something about what I'm putting out there that somebody will be into. Yeah. Uh, that that it's like if I'm having a hard time romantically, maybe it's not a problem with me. Maybe it's that I'm hiding me. It's like when people get past like the presentation, the the ways I think I need to present myself, and they get like to my flavor, and they get to that kind of like animal pheromonal like attraction thing. Then it's like, oh, that's a specific flavor that I I'm not into, and nobody nobody chooses their attraction. It, tr- attraction has a lot of very deep intelligence. And if we're able to kind of put that flavor out more in the forefront or at least incorporate it into our self-image a bit more, you know, that's like working on a blind spot is working also on the self-image because we Mm -hmm. have to change a little bit how we see ourselves. Somebody who struggles, whether they're blind or middle with sexual, have to see more of their juice and, and to kind of like learn to like be turned on by themselves and to be like, this is a weird little freak flag thing I do and it's cool. (laughs) I'll also say that it's very easy to look at the sexual ones and be like, that sounds more exciting or interesting. Yeah. But somebody who's sexual dominant is enslaved to these. And mm-hmm. it can be like this really desperate, vampiric, selling myself out or harming myself or other people, objectifying myself. It can be very empty and hollow. Mm-hmm. So we all have a way that we can project something's better somewhere else. But what what like you might be responding to is like, man, I might be more interesting if I included these things. Like I'm getting turned on, baby, by the thought of how I might be if I did X, Y, or Z. You know, I don't find uh, sexual ties more enviable because it's like, I don't know, suffering is everywhere. No, totally. I am. Um, I never think others have it easy at all because it's it's just never true, is it? Um, let's get to social. So the first approach of the social drive of availability, opening personal boundaries to invite and receive others. Attention is fanned out, outward and open with receptivity to who or what enters our field of attention. It includes being receptive to the inner life of others. Yeah. So before I started working on this, like I would have thought I was a pretty... Um... Maybe not open person, but I would have thought that I really like saw people. <laughs> and then I, I realized like I'm like profoundly cut off and I'm profoundly like my boundaries are just like really just a giant like exoskeleton middle finger that is just like <laughs> stay away from me. <laughs> and I would go. um I remember a couple of dinners with like going out to dinner with like a, a, a social type and they were just like so wide open that anybody that walked in our field, it was like their attention would go to this person. Mm-hmm. And I was getting really frustrated because I was like, I'm trying to have a conversation with you. Yeah. And you're like, like trying to press the small A or whatever, you know, and it was like, it's very annoying. And so I was like, what is this person doing? Uh, as a as a very fussy four, I'm like, what is driving me crazy about this person? <laughs> And this is not all social types, by the way. This is just my experience with this one. But I was like, this person, he was like really overdoing it. And I was like, like, I I spent a lot of time trying to understand why people annoy me because I'm annoyed all the time. And so it's like, what can I learn from this? Or like, what can what's actually useful here? And so I started applying it to my less neurotic social types that I was in my life. And I was like, oh, they're open. They're open. Like, what am I doing? People constantly telling me I'm how not open I am. And like, you know, speaking of myself as a sexual type, like, especially when I was younger, I really felt ignored by women. Like, I really felt Mm -hmm. overlooked. I felt really whatever. But my partners would be like, they'd be like, oh, I'm very attracted to you. And like, people are attracted to you, but you're so closed off. And you're so telling people like, fuck off energetically that, yeah, people are not going to approach you. They're not going to like be very receptive and they're not like they're going to feel like, oh, if I look at that guy, he's going to bite my head off. And I was like, oh, man, like even my social blindness is sabotaging my sexual drive. And so this is just about like like actually relaxing your boundary a little bit and actually opening it up. People who are low social do not realize how insular, Mm -hmm. how closed, how uninvitational they are they might feel like i'm just doing my thing we are habitually broadcasting i'm not available i'm not available i'm not available mm-hmm. and so this is literally just like you can just practice this on your own you, th- you know even if you're high social just like see if you can sense boundaries behind you mm-hmm. like at physically behind yourself like open your boundaries to just being available to like presence behind you or lack of presence behind you if that makes any sense and you start realizing your habitual direction of attention and energy Somebody who is maybe social dominant, but self, self-pres self blind, they might be like an old cloud that mm-hmm. is like available to anything that might be coming into their atmosphere. Mm-hmm. Whereas somebody who is self uh, social blind, they might have a very limited, dense atmosphere that nothing comes in. You know, from the point of view of not just like, oh, I need to grow, but just from functioning and being like uh, having relationships, learning how to just like open and relax the boundary is a huge deal. Yeah, 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 yeah. I have also overestimated the extent to which I make myself available 
available to others. Yeah, yeah. So there's a there's a way that we can be overly available to people such mm. that we don't focus on our own stuff. Mm. We don't develop our own independent interests or time alone. And then there's other ways that we can, especially if we're low social, that we get greedy about our time and our energy. And the thing is, is that all of us are very sensitive and that we do easily get overwhelmed more than we think by other people's energy, by other people's sensitivity. And so it is like using the self-present instinct anchoring in with the social instinct. It's like, how do I have this sort of flow of giving myself space and giving other people space? Perfect. Thank you. Signaling the second approach of the social drive, sensing one's impact on others and the flow of exchange. This also involves conveying feelings and intentions appropriately to the situation via body language. Yeah, so this is another thing I sort of notice is that people would like as a social blind, I was like, people don't understand how I feel like mm -hmm. well, even when I think how I feel is clear like, if I like them they probably don't know I like them because mm -hmm. I'm not giving them a lot of gestures I'm not giving them a lot of facial expressions or verbal affirmation and I'm not conveying much about myself you know I have, I have like a, a shirt on with a graphic but mm -hmm. generally I'm just all in black so I'm not signaling anything about myself other than like sexual stuff that I'm like be interested in like my tattoos or whatever but I'm mm -hmm. not like this is the kind of person I am there's no like LinkedIn energy, you know? And so it's like <laughs> sig signaling is a little bit about like, like, how do I like, and I'm, I'm learning, but I always feel kind of like a, uh, like I'm a, a, some kind of alien creature wearing a human suit. That's like learning how to smile. And like, this is a smile. This is, this is <laughs> smiling time. This is like nodding, you know? And it's like, they're all skilled. Like I have to develop, but like, I usually just be like, you know, just like very, uh, mm -hmm. stone faced unless I was like, sexually like getting excited about something so i remember <laughs> i remember uh one of my my best friends that i met in college like i was like just like lurking around him in a couple like small friend group and that was like you know i was even more weird than i am now and like very like <sighs> you know and the thing he's a six and he's like really fucking funny and it was this thing where we became friends because i wouldn't say very much i wouldn't speak much <laughs> But he would make me laugh so hard, you know, and I'd just be like from my like like my stern look, then all of a sudden just be like, blah, you know, just like like laughing hysterically. And uh, that's how we became friends. But in retrospect, it's a funny story because how little I was signaling. The signaling is a little bit about like like how like kind of talking about I mentioned it with with magnetism earlier, but like. This is a little bit about how I show the kind of person I am, what I'm curious mm -hmm. about, what I what I what I'm, what touches me, mm -hmm. like, and I'm I'm putting a little bit of effort in to show you that something has touched me. Mm -hmm. You know, some people can overdo it; and it feels a little bit insincere, and but they're trying to communicate. And so this mm -hmm. is like this is trying to communicate, and it happens through the body. It's happening through body language, like. And mm -hmm. So this is like having some kind of a body awareness in terms of how it impacts people. Okay, that's really clarifying, actually letting other people know who you are linkedin energy like this is not just linkedin energy but like no, sometimes no. It, you know like that the whole point of linkedin is like to show like who you yeah. are or something you know anyway mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the third approach of the social drive navigating sensing the layers boundaries and nuances of social environments and circumstances this brings texture to social context which helps us to recognize the mechanics of interpersonal dynamics knowing one's place role or relationship within them mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah this is i mean it's as you described it's like the the sense of the texture and nuances and different levels of just like what's happening in interpersonal react interaction so like you and i speaking like i know that we're like in a different countries you know mm -hmm. that we're that, like i'm understanding the context i'm understanding that i'm being interviewed i'm understanding mm -hmm. like being a male being a female you know like all there's all these cues and things that are just we take for granted generally mm -hmm. speaking about like what's setting the parameters of an interaction as navigating is like being aware of those things and taking note of them but it's happening through the body it's happening like mentally yeah there's activity going on but like there's a way of reading us dynamic there's reading what's appropriate to it and not by violating those boundaries like you like your body language by how much you like lean in how much you lean out if you're looking away from me if you're looking at me they're all giving me information about your level of engagement your level of comfort you know like you just like i just said comfort and you just mm, you know like you just sent me signal that like oh something is resonating that i'm actually you're hearing me and i'm hearing and that we're engaged together rather than being like okay well you know i'm i'm somewhere else or whatever and this also applies to large social contexts where um my i'm a social blind four with a five my younger sister is a social dominant three wing two and she is the social queen of the universe 
And she goes into a room and it, she's like, Michaela, you know, it's just like she's here. And so, you know, she talks about we've gotten in detail with this and she she can be in a room and be like, oh, they're having a conversation over there. They're upset with each other over there. She can feel these like layers and textures and boundaries and like this like rainbow of 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 colors happening in a social environment. And historically, I don't pick up on any of that shit. And mm-hmm. I will just like disrupt things without even knowing it and just being a being an idiot because I'm just like walking into stuff like hey what's up like I like I'm very withdrawn and and, and solitary but at school dances they would know that I would I would start dancing because I didn't care like I didn't I wasn't aware of anything so they just would be like put on thriller and get John out there like and I'm not saying a source type one started dance or something but like they're just so aware of like the different voices and textures and things happening around them and and they can you know be aware to their detriment but there's a sense of being in the body that we start to realize all these indications and signals and things that are happening when we put our attention on people, how people affect us in a, in a body way and trusting our bodies to be vehicles of communication, uh, of vehicles of knowing, knowing other people. Sometimes we can over rely on our own bodies and shut people out. And other times we can just be so like trying to maintain a connection or discover an intimacy or something, uh, trying to have a connection and ignoring what our body's telling us about other people. Like having a good navigating can be like, all right, this person is worthy of trusting or being a friend and this person, you know, sucks or don't go near them or they're bad for you. Makes sense. Thank you for for going through them all for for us. That was just so great. I love it. I learned a lot. I feel, I appreciate you like wanting to talk about this because it's hard to talk about or and describe but I also felt like I wasn't sure if anybody would like pick up on what I thought was very significant you know like like to me this stuff like the blind spot is really the key and so working with the blind spot you need to like you, I think these are I'm not saying these are objectively right I'm not saying they're the final word but like they're my best temp- attempts at like fleshing something out yeah. that's not about just like doing a club or yeah. you know brush your teeth or you know whatever I think this is the only framework we have out there in the Enneagram field at the moment, a sort of solid way to integrate the blind instinct. Do we combine, you know, using these sort of somatic practices and with um, more behavioral practices? Like, Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we touched a little bit on some of them, but yeah. like there's a million things somebody who's self blind has just not done because it requires them to focus their attention on something. I remember one time a self blind person asked me to install Apple's Apple iTunes on their computer. And it's like, that's some dumb thing, but it like requires this like, all right, I download this thing. It goes mm-hmm. to this folder. I find the folder. I then unzip it. Mm-hmm. And then I do these processes. And it's like really boring, but it's requiring a sustained attention to get a concrete aim met. You know, like cooking, learning to be present to cooking is huge. And it's actually something in the Gurdjieff work. It's, you know, like if you get into the process Enneagram, the mm-hmm. original Enneagram, you will run into a million metaphors of cooking in the kitchen, transformational alchemy of food and, and, and the way that that leads to a meal. Because that process of transformation, of taking a raw material into a refined material mm-hmm. is so basic to every ancient culture when, when they do food offerings. They don't actually think like spirits or something are going to like eat food. Mm-hmm. It's about the feeding from the energies of transformation that lead a crude material into a refined material. That kind of practice of just like cooking and noticing like the impact of heat the impact of something a new new thing being applied to a process for a self pres blind person doing a process like fixing the sink they get to that first point of resistance that point where new energy needs to come in and they're like oh i gotta call my super i gotta call my neighbor i gotta call my friend it's like just fucking just stay with it and something will come in you know what i'm saying it's like that new energy will come in and you'll like know what to do and you fix the damn sink. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. Um, okay, so we do use behavioral practices in addition to the sort of somatic practices. Right. And, and I guess it, all of this has to be customized, doesn't it? It depends whatever, what what the goal is. Um, depends on the circumstance and the type yeah. and the, all that kind of stuff. Like, so like with sexual, if you're already in a romantic or sexual relationship, you could look at like how you actually uh, are sexual with your partner and like how much you're actually sensing yourself during sexual acts, how much you're actually sensing your partner, 
Like, how actually turned on are you by your partner? Mm. And, you know, there is the thing of like, yeah, you can't have everything in a relationship, but how much are you also kind of like shoving off the table mm. to like make something work or trying to make maybe a social relationship, a sexual relationship? How much are you comfortable with like putting your flavor out there and like flexing or whatever it is that's like mm. going to entice and turn your partner? partner on and how much are they turned on by you in a genuine way like like something that um i find that a lot of people suffer from is that when the relationship starts there's a lot of chemistry and a lot of whatever but then it quickly stops mm -hmm. and they're like oh well maybe we can get that back or maybe that's just how it goes and maybe that is true and maybe the other something else is true but like we don't get too fixated on how you think it ought to go mm -hmm. so with sexual drive it's like when you put your flavor out there are you with somebody that actually likes that flavor that should tell you a lot about even the long-term sustainability of that relationship right like yeah. if you're putting your flavor out there that's your flavor yeah. And your partner's not liking it, like that doesn't mean they're a bad person. That doesn't mean mm -hmm. there's something wrong with either partner. But it's like being a romantic sexual relationship that seems like it's not going to have, I mean, from my point of view, not going to have a lot of longevity. So like mm -hmm. what steps do you have to take? What what do you have to look at that you've been avoiding looking at because of that? It's all so brutal. This it's brutal. brutal. It's <laughs> totally brutal. It's totally brutal. Uh, yeah, everybody's everybody's suffering. Everybody's fucked up and it's okay, <laughs> you know. So integrating the, the blind instinct, you said it seems like you're pretty clear that this is always it's like the potent transformational work we do. I don't know. I think I've been around teachers who have said that sometimes you work on the second instinct. Uh, sometimes that's the correct inter intervention. Before I let you answer the question, I want to read something from the book, which was so interesting. So normally we are unable to sacrifice attention to our dominant instinct, but concerns for our secondary instinct can be doorways for us to indirectly attend to the needs of the blind spot. The feeling of regulation in the middle instinct may relax us enough to indulge in the blind spot. And then you give these great examples of how it would look to use self prayers middle to access sexual blind and, and the other way around. How would it look to use sexual middle to access social blind? Okay, so yeah, this that would be like a self pressed sexual type. Yeah. And the idea in self pressed sexual type is that being too open, too available, to dis it's I, I feel like I'm gonna be dispersed and it's gonna mm. threaten my physical well being and it's gonna make me seem uninteresting. But it's like accessing sexual is like, well, do you want a sexual partner? Do you want to be attractive? Do you want to have this flirtatious energy? You need to engage human beings, mm. you know? And so you need to be out in the world in some way. You need to have some way that you exist in a social sphere. And so like a lot of people who are self prosexual you know, that is the most insular instinctual stacking there is. And there's a way that people who are self prosexual more than any other stacking can have a hard time having a public or, or, or social presence. And I don't just mean like social media, I just mean like in the party, like at a social gathering or something, they could just be very cut off and not having any idea about it. And so it's like, all right, are, are, are there anybody who's attractive to me? Is there anybody who's interesting or juicy? And do I want to show them something about myself? Mm -hmm. That can be a doorway into getting into the social instinct for somebody who is self sexual. Mm -hmm. Does that make that sense? Makes sense, yeah. Huh. Maybe you can probably handle this briefly, but so is having a dominant instinct like having an, an Enneagram type in that when when we are present, we will manifest its higher expression more so than we manifest the higher expressions of the other two instincts. I'd say that basically the short answer is yes. The more complicated answer is that, you know, um, when we are present, we're present to all three. When we're pre but we've built our personality around fulfilling a certain need and, and, and enhancing features of our personality that will get those dominant needs met. So we're always going to be a self prized type, a social type, a sexual type. But when we are more present, when we are, our dominant instinct functions in a much more, um, it's much more alive. It's less of a cartoon. If I'm a social type and I'm using my self prized and sexual instincts too, I become so much more myself and I become, I be able to represent myself in a way that's really authentic, that's really people can see who I am. And I'm not trying to dampen anything to be included or liked. I'm including myself. I'm really showing you who I am and that quality of the social instinct to discern who I want to be with and, and in what way, what capacity becomes mm -hmm. sharper because I'm including my also my sexual responses to this person. I'm including just like how they affect me on a boundary physical way. 
And so it's not just like, oh, they've got a very entertaining personality that I'm really enjoying con conversing with. I'm getting a lot more data. Mm. Same thing with sexual and listening to other two instincts. I'm not just getting uh, or repelled. I'm like, this is a person. This is, I, and I'm a person. And like, all right, like maybe there's some juice here, but like, I don't have to be romantically interested in them or romantically repelled by them. And I don't like, I used to unconsciously relate to people in terms of how much they like excited me. And I didn't realize I was like doing that. I didn't realize I was basically objectifying people. And I wasn't just being like, are they hot or not? It was just, is there like juice here or not? And so I had no tolerance for people that didn't juice me up. And so how do like, and I realized I hurt people that way just by like making them feel in, like boring. And it wasn't because they were boring, it's just because I didn't personally respond to their energy. Mm -hmm. So it was very hurtful. And with self-pres, it's like being in touch with my social and sexual drives, it makes my, all the things I enjoy, all like just so much more enhanced and better. And instead of kind of feeling like I'm trudging through things I'm obligated to do to maintain my whatever, there's pleasure, there's enjoyment, there's feeling companionship in it, there's feeling um, meaning. A lot of the social drive brings us is a sense of meaning or purpose or vocation. Mm. And so when we don't have much of a social drive, our, the whatever we're doing to like earn money or earn a living or whatever feels totally empty and irrelevant. Mm. All our talents or things we like to do, like e like self-pressed types can get all like in there like, oh, I love to cook my meal. But it's like, go that satisfaction only goes so far. But what if you're able to, to sometimes share it with people? Not to say you mm. got to be on all the time. Mm. Or, you know, like, uh, yeah, like just in the sexual stuff too. It's like, what if I'm like into myself for these two? You know, what if mm -hmm. I'm feeling myself because of these things? Like mm -hmm. if I if I'm like like I play music or something and it's like I enjoy it, but like, what if I like play music to feel myself? Mm -hmm. And like, what what does that mean? And then what can I show to people when I'm interested in them? Thank you. Do you think we ever get really competent, good, present with the blind instinct? And then how do we know we've integrated the blind instinct? The the, the integration is never complete. Mm -hmm. We can always be better at all of them. We can always be better at our dominant. We can always be better at our middle. We can always be better at our blind. Like it just gets deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. But the only way to know if you've integrated or are integrating or working with it is to uh, to be present. Mm -hmm. And the only way to be present is two things, to sense and to see how not present we are. You know, one of the mistakes that we make with being present is that we start to reward ourselves. We're like, I'm so present or mm -hmm. I was present all this time. We get very prideful of it. And it's like, if we're doing that, we're not present. Part of why something like the Enneagram is a useful tool is it shows us we're asleep. And we grow not by giving ourselves points for being awake, but by seeing more deeply and deeply and deeply our sleep, our sleep, our sleep, our sleep. And it's kind of like, you know, the metaphor of the, like being in a, in a prison, not knowing you're in a prison. Uh, Enneagram helps us see that we're in a prison and what our prison bars look like. But it's not just like, oh, I'm in a prison, I gotta get out of here. It's like, I gotta keep seeing and seeing and seeing more deeply. This is what the prison is, this is the prison. And oh my God, even this thing is the prison. And the thing I thought was the salvation from the prison is the prison too. You know, it's like in the Gurdjieff work, there is being delusional, mm. then there's being automatic, which is like, you know, you're just, you're fine, you're not delusional, but you're not, you're not present. Mm. You're just in the normal world. And then there's being sensitive, being like present, what we normally attribute to presence. And then realizing that like that level is still not it, that there's still something beyond that, that we can only like make room for. And so even our sense of what presence is and feels like is not the thing. Presence requires a genuine humility, which is not, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't like myself, or I don't feel confident. It's just like, this is not it. This is not it. This is not it. And any time we start to build ourselves up for our presence or that I'm the person that practices presence, any time we try to make ourselves special through it, we're not present. Inner work is the death of specialness. There's no benefit whatsoever to see how present we are. Mm -hmm. There's only benefit in seeing how we're not present. Got it. Um, what are you going to do next, John? So now that you've given birth to this, what's at your learning edge? What's yet to come into sharp focus for you in the Enneagram world? Gosh. So yeah, that's kind of the thing is like, I, I'm a little burned out from this book. Mm -hmm. Um, and it took a long time. Um, was it years? How long did it take? Like five or six years from beginning to like, I, when I started, I thought like, Oh, I know the Enneagram. I know the instincts. I'll just get this out in a, you know, and then I'll get to the real stuff. Mm -hmm. And you know, and it ended up like, cause like the book is not really about the instincts for me. It's really about like what inner work looks like in the mm -hmm. first stage of inner work, the first real stage. Like in Sufism, they have the finaz, the, and, you know, four finaz. And like, this is like the, how I understand the prep work for the first finah. 
so to speak. But um, what's next is like, you know, I'm like I mentioned Egypt. Mm. I'm interested in the origins, the Enneagram, and the origins, the Western, you know, all, Gurdjieff, all that stuff, Western spiritual tradition, um, going back to ancient Egypt. That's a whole thing that I want to understand, like Neoplatonism and all this other shit. Uh, I was thinking about doing an actual beginner's book on the Enneagram. There's way too many, but I don't like any of them, yeah. you know, like a real basic how I would do it, beginners, and I, hopefully yeah. using humor to make fun of the types too. I get a little tired of like the self-help lingo and stuff. Mm -hmm. And what if I just roasted the types? And then another one is like, you know, part of the Gurdjieff thing is there's the higher intellectual center and the higher emotional center. In the book, I talk about the virtues, is, which I think belong to just the normal emotional center. And mm -hmm. so what is the higher centers? And then finally, on the podcast, we've been working on this like object relations, hexad attachment yeah. thing and understanding it from, from like a whole new fucking level. Mm -hmm. And so we might all write a book together. Yeah. There's all kinds of like, there's like too many ideas right now. And I'm sort of waiting for uh, life to um, force me in a direction. We'll see where wow, it goes. Wow, what would your sort of instinctual sequence, what would be the maneuver to, to do here? Would it be, would you let the social instinct determine where you put your energies into next? Being, like I'm a slave to my instincts. And so I has to have a sexual hit. It has to be like this, oh, this. And then I'll be like, all right, what's the social uh, like utility for this stuff? Like mm -hmm. why would I teach it or waste my time? And then uh, self-praise would be like, how much am I going to actually sit and do this thing? <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. All right. Thank you so much cool. for this Thanks, and for your time. This has been so great. Um, all right. I'm going to hit a stop. My next interviewee is Dr. Janeshri Govindasamy. And we're going to be having a conversation around presence. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, review. And yeah, I guess have a good Christmas.